Good morning. Um, this is the day that the Lord has made. Scripture said we will rejoice and be glad in it. I want to greet you this morning in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm Rodolfo Peterkin, president and founder of Rodolfo Peterkin Ministries and the Seed Center Church. We're located at 420 South Babcock in the Melbourne area, Melbourne, Florida. For those of you who would love to come visit with us, we would sure uh, love to have you to come by and share with us. Um, of course, we are uh, observing the uh, social distancing that's going on all around this world, and um, uh, we surely invite you to come as things open back up and uh, we're able to function the way we are accustomed to, to some degree, then we would definitely uh, Appreciate you coming by and visiting with us. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, for the time being, then uh, we're doing quite a bit uh, online. And uh, <clears throat> we surely invite you to uh, connect with us, uh, get a group together and, and listen, uh, have Bible study with us, um, and, uh, you know, just share in the love of Christ, all right? Um, you know, in, 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 uh, in our services, you are welcome to uh, put any questions uh, or comments that you would like to put uh, on the screen. We invite you to do that, and that way we're able to uh, address any questions or any concerns that you might have. Uh, and so we, we, uh, we would love for you to uh, just do that. So you know, if, if it's available, if you if you can and it's, uh, you know, you would like to do that, then we uh, definitely encourage you to uh, uh, put some things, you know, some questions or comments that you may have. Love to invite you also to uh, make sure you go to YouTube and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, just pull us up, Rodolfo Peterkin, and you're able to do that. Um, uh, we also love, love to invite you to check out our new website, all right, if there, uh, if you would love to be part of our prayer team, then we will encourage you to sign up, sign your name up. Uh, uh, if you would love to just uh, receive our newsletter, you can also do that, all right. But either way, uh, we are delighted that you are here with us on this morning, and uh, we can share the love of God with us, with you, all right? Uh, don't forget, uh, those of you who are listening this morning, um, uh, don't forget your, your love and your like button, all right? Uh, we love for you to do that. Uh, usually in a service, you know, you're there to say amen or, or something, and so I can see you, but you can see me. And so we encourage you to just, uh, you know, just... Give us your likes and your loves, which tells us that uh, either the Word of God is resonating with you, uh, you're bearing witness with what is being said, all right? Uh, that encourages and encourages us also on this side, all right? So we want to encourage you to do that. All right, uh, beloved, uh, God is good, and uh, as the scripture says, His mercy endures forever. We have been uh, talking to you over the uh, months, maybe not months, but uh, this new series that we've been teaching, we have been talking about uh, being led by the Holy Spirit uh, and the importance of us being led by the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, I, I reckon... Uh, I reckon that we, we, and all of this has happened because of the fall, we have become so uh, outwardly conscious. Uh, we are conscious uh, of, of our surroundings outwardly. Um, you know, our senses, our five senses are, are really energized. We, we, we live by them. Uh, and when it comes to spiritual things, sometimes it's so difficult for us because we are not inward conscious. Uh, we are not spirit conscious. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the path that I'm taking uh, in sharing God's word is, is hopefully 
to get those of you who are born again to understand and to and to uh, turn your attention also inwardly and to understand uh, who you are and what you are. This enables us, <clears throat> uh, this enables us to, to exercise ourselves to be spirit conscious, to, 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 to be, be sensitive, to, to kind of learn how to tune in. This is what happened to me when I first got saved. And everybody talked about hearing God. And I, you know, I was one of the guys that I was like, God doesn't talk to me. I can't hear him. I, I don't hear him. And I would say these things because I was so outwardly conscious. Uh, my senses was, was you know, uh, I, I was conscious of my senses and, 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 I, and the outward things that's going on. So I was expecting to hear God with my ears. There's nothing wrong with that, uh, but, you know, God very rarely uh, speaks to someone outwardly. He did it a lot in the New Testament because men were dead. They were dead spiritually, right? Uh, but in the New Testament, uh, God could still speak to us outwardly, and that may happen to us once once in a lifetime. Uh, but but God mostly speaks to us in our hearts, right? He speaks to us in our hearts, and so these these are the things that I, I have been uh, establishing as we go along before we move into how the Holy Spirit led us. So we talked about the church and the kingdom. We talked about the authority of those who are in the kingdom of God that God gives us all authority, right? Because if we're in the kingdom, we have been restored to our rightful place. Uh, like Luke 15 says, God has restored us to our, our rightful place in him and in the kingdom. So now we're not, we not uh, individuals that are dead spiritually to God. We are individuals now that have become alive unto God. All right? These, these are, these are uh, things that we need to know and understand. So... So I've been uh, I've been establishing this as we go along, and so uh, we went from that to the to the the church and the kingdom, right? To the person of the Holy Spirit, right? And so we understand that the church is the ecclesia, those who are called out. We meet in a building, but the church is the people. It is a community of people, and so we we went from there and and we started talking about the 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 person of the holy spirit and how that he present distinct characteristics as a person the bible says in john 4:24 that god is a spirit god is not spirit he's a spirit that means that he he's an entity he's a personality and he possesses all the attributes of of a person right uh, and so, and so, the Bible also tells us that He's the Father of Spirit. So, so we we begin to understand that all of us, uh, Christian and non-Christian, God created us. Uh, in Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-eight, uh, twenty twenty-eight through about thirty thirty-one. God created us in His image, which means we are spirit beings. We have a soul, and we live in a body. It's, it's important for us to understand this if we're going to be led by the Spirit of God, all right? And so we started talking about that, and we concluded uh, uh, last, uh, was that Thursday, uh, talking about, uh, and I wanted just to go here, we looked at Romans chapter 8. That is the, state, the theme scripture, and I asked you to study and to read Romans 6, 7, and 8, right? So that way... Uh, uh, you can not only hear what I'm saying, but you can interact with me. You may have questions that you want to ask. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. All right. And so we looked at Romans chapter eight and Romans chapter eight and verse uh, 13 says, for if you live after the flesh, okay, hopefully we can, we can decipher or cover these things so that you can have a better grasp of the meaning of these things. It says, for if you live after the flesh, you must die or you shall die. But if you through the Spirit 
mortify the deeds of the body, you will live. And then it says, for as many, this is where we are, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, uh, they are the sons of God. And so we established Thursday night that the word sons here is the word weos, or weos, right? H-U-I-O-S. And what that, what that word means, it means the matured son. It means the person who has become matured in God. And so therefore God is able to release to that person uh, the, the destiny, is able to put that person in that place now where they can fulfill the, their destiny. So God turns over to them the inheritance or, or his inheritance for them to, to, to carry out the, the dealings or the mandate of the Father. Are you following me? And so it means that you have come to a place of maturity to where the Father can surrender certain things to you for you uh, uh, to, to, to fulfill these things. And hence is, is that he turns over our inheritance. <clears throat> so this is talking about a matured son. I said that when my mother had me, uh, I was few seconds old. I was her son. I was her son when I was a few seconds old. I was her son when I was a toddler. When I was uh, at a, a, an adolescent, I was her son when I was a teenager. And even when I became a matured individual, I am still her son. So the word sons can mean different stages in your human, I'm sorry, in your spiritual development. So when you read it, so when you go to 1 John, <clears throat> and we looked at 1 John, and this is for those who did, who did not hear uh, last week or Thursday night, but listen, if you go to 1 John, he says, uh, chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, I write unto you fathers because you have known him, that is from the beginning. So there are fathers in the house of God. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked. Well, we have young men in the kingdom. And I write unto you little children because you have known the father. So now you have fathers, you have young men, and you have little children, right? <clears throat> and then if you look at First Peter, if you look at First Peter, First uh, Peter chapter chapter 1 uh, verse 20, 23 uh, Peter says to be born again not of the corruptible seed but of the co incorruptible seed by the word of God which lives and abides for ever and then he talks about also that as newborn babes right as newborn babes, you and I are to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. So you have newborn babes, you 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 have newborns, you have adolescents, you have uh, young men, teenagers, you have fathers, you have adults. So so you have these stages in 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 spiritually speaking. That's also. Uh, uh, that God refers to in his word about us. So when we look at Romans 8, we, we're 8 and verse 14, God, uh, you can look this word up. This word, uh, uh, sons, is talking about a matured son or one who have come into the place of maturity in the things of God, right? And so thereby, just like in the natural, a, an individual that's matured, uh, uh, the, the family or the father or the mother uh, uh, they're, they are trustworthy and they're able to turn certain things over to them. And so it is in the things of God. Now, sometimes in some circles, you may, you may see different, but God wants you and I to develop and mature in the things of God to where you don't depend on an individual, you depend on the Holy Spirit of God. This is the reason why you need to know him. Okay, he's not a it, he's not a thing, he is a person. 
He is the person that took care of Jesus in the womb, that watched over him while he was in the womb, that, that, that led Mary and Joseph where he was to be born. It was the Holy Spirit that did all of this. It was the Holy Spirit that came upon him and baptized him uh, when he was 30 years old and released him into the ministry. Here it is. It's the same thing I'm talking about. The, the matured son released him into the calling that God had on his life. It was, the, it was through the Holy Spirit that Jesus did everything that he did. It was by the Spirit, Hebrews chapter 9, that God raised Jesus from the dead. You follow me? It is, it is, it is, it is the Holy Spirit that Jesus sent back to us when he left. He sent him back to us, and he is the one that's in care of the church. He's the one that's came for the church. So notice, it's the Holy Spirit that will empower the church. It's the Holy Spirit that works redemption in, in the lives of believers. It's the Holy Spirit that helps us to develop and mature. It's the Holy Spirit. Watch me now. If you don't hear anything else I tell you, you listen to me carefully. It is the Holy Spirit that's able to bring you into the poor place where you fulfill the reason and the purpose that God designed you on this earth. That's the Holy Spirit's job. That's not my job. My job and, and, and those who God has called in the fivefold ministry, we are called to teach you and to, and to help you to mature and to come into a place of maturity so that you by the Spirit can fulfill the destiny that God has placed in your life. You understand? So God is not de depending on you and I to you and I to, to depend on an individual all the days of your life. You may do that at the beginning because you're a babe and you don't know how. But as you develop and mature, the more you develop, the more you learn to lean and depend on the Holy Spirit. So what, what we do is when, when we talk about following the Holy Spirit, you're literally talking about being subject, submissive, and dependent on the Spirit of God. Are you following me? So let's look at the Word. Let's go back and let's try to continue where we were uh, at the beginning. So if you go to Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> Romans chapter 8. I'll encourage you to listen to last week, those of you who weren't here, listen to Thursday night, and that will kind of bring you up to where we are so that we can uh, continue. It says here, <clears throat> let me see if I can, uh, well, let's, let's read Romans 6 and verse 4. It says, therefore, uh, we are buried with him by baptism. Okay, and this is the, the symbolic meaning of baptism. We're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, even so we also should walk where? In newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. <clears throat> now that's not talking about when you get to heaven. That's talking about now. You see? And 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 this this uh, doesn't happen in the life of believers who are not taught the truth or who do not come into a knowledge of this truth and, and learn how to uh, uh, learn how to employ or learn how to uh, live out this truth. This is a truth of the, of the gospel that you and I need to understand. <clears throat> he says, knowing this, <clears throat> so you ought to know this. He said that our old man is crucified with him. The old you is crucified with him. That the body of sin. Now notice, he says the body of sin and not sins. Because he's talking about the old person. And you go back to Romans 4, 5, and 6. And it'll make perfect sense to you when you come up to chapter 6 here. He says, knowing this, that the old man is crucified, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay, so here he's talking about the nature, and we dealt with that, and I, I showed you that uh, on Thursday night. He's talking about the nature, 
that person that you and I became when Adam sinned and 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 God had to leave him, right? Adam by his own volition and choice chose Satan. So Satan became his father. Hence you see the fall and all the chaos that's in the world as a result of that. That is what we're talking about, the old man. And so the Bible says that when Christ died on the cross, he was dying for you. Now notice it said, now if he be dead, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Well, when do you start living with him? You start living with him right now. Okay? Here's the question. It says Romans, it is said in Romans 8, 19, that the creation waits in expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. All right? I, un I understand nature was used to commit evil in man's fault. Can you explain what nature and why is nature awaiting to see the manifestation of, of the sons of God? Let's look at that. Romans 8 and uh, verse 19. Okay. Uh, if you just go back up, just go up uh, where we were. Uh, this will flow right into what I'm, I'm talking about, so it won't detour me uh, much at all. It says, verse 15, Romans 8 says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. You understand that? That's not the spirit you're born again in. That is not the spirit you and I received when we were born again. You received the Holy Spirit, right? And so it says, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby you cry, Abba, 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 you are sons now. You see, you are sons, even you women, you are sons of God, okay? Me meaning that, that you now have uh, God's uh, character and nature in you. Your spirit has been literally recreated in Christ. Then he says, the spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Now, uh, how do you know that you are born again? Uh, you didn't hear any thunder roll. You didn't hear, see any lightning flash, right? Some of us had a, a marvelous experience. Others didn't. But after a few years the experience, with the experience, uh, you know, you, you, you're living and walking with God. You can't just live off of the experience, right? So it says that one of the things that the Holy Spirit does when you and I are born again he witnesses, he gives you the assurance, he gives you the inner knowing on the inside that you have been made a child of the living God. You understand this? So if the Holy Spirit, if one of the most important things in your life and mine is to be born again, and the Holy Spirit can attest to the fact, can give you the, the, the witness, can give you the assurance, that can give you the knowing that you are, and you haven't seen Jesus. You haven't been to heaven. So if that's one of the primary ways that the Holy Spirit does that, that it indicates to you and I, that's one of the primary ways that the Holy Spirit is going to lead you in life. He's going to lead you by the inner witness, the inner knowing on the inside. Are you following me? The same way you can know that you're born again, that's how the Spirit of God will lead you. And then he goes on and he says, uh, uh, since you are children, then you have an inheritance. You're an heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. That's plain and simple, right? You have an inheritance in Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified. For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is going to be manifested and or revealed to us. It says, for the earnest expectation of the creature or the creation waits for the manifestations, the revealing of the sons of God. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think God is saying here? That the whole creation, everything about this world, you see, because the world was subject to where it is because of us and by us. And so the whole creation is waiting for this 
uh, this for, for us to come into this place where we begin to walk and function like sons of God. And ultimately, uh, that the whole creation itself will be renewed by the power of the living Christ. But, but the whole creation is waiting in anticipation for the unveiling, for, 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 for us to, to, to come into that place of sonship. That's what we're talking about. Where we know, where we come into revelation and understanding of who we are and we begin to function. We begin to walk and function on that level and in that dimension as sons of the living God. Are you, are you, are you understanding that? Bible said the whole creation. Don't just think about the, the, the earth, the soil. Think about the people. Think about what, what, what the children of God would be able to do and accomplish if we walk in our sonship. You see, you see, in church, we're not just only supposed to understand sin and know about sin and know about how evil sin is and what sin will do to our lives. That is biblical, and we should teach and talk about sin. But listen to me, that's not the only place we're supposed to be camped out at. We are supposed to have a very great and deep understanding of the person of God, who he is, and who we are in him. So that we can function and walk in the things that God had designed for us to do. When the Bible says the creation, does, does, it, does it include the angels as well? No. I don't think so. I think here in this chapter, it is talking about the creation of God. Angels can, can, will no doubt see this and understand this. They're, they will no doubt see us walking and moving in the things of God uh, uh, the way it needs to be. But I think down here, uh, that's a good point because I think down here, Creation itself down here is waiting, is anticipating, is is earnestly anticipating for us uh, uh, to 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 get into our rightful place and to function in that rightful place. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, angels are part of the creation of God. Uh, I guess, I guess, in one sense, it will benefit. Because you and I will begin to function the way God wants us to function. And so angels will be able to, 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 to actively be doing the things that they're supposed to do in line with us. Instead of sometimes being uh, uh, unemployed uh, because the things that we are saying and the things that we're doing is not in line with God. But I, 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 w I, wouldn't, I wouldn't take that completely out of the pot. But I really, uh, I really look at the fact how the, the, the creation here uh, is, is anticipating, is waiting, is, is looking. Uh, the creation itself is waiting for that, that, that period where God's sons can come, to, can come to manifestation. And of course, no doubt, it is also groaning because it's been subject to sin. So it is groaning for that time where God can change it. All right. All right. So, and you know, we'll touch on that some more as we go along. So now if we, if we are sons of God, notice that the Bible says in Romans chapter six and verse, verse nine, it says, it says, uh, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more. Death has no more dominion. I want you to understand that death has no more dominion. Death has no more dominion. Dominion is the word that you use for a king. It doesn't have govern. Uh, it doesn't govern, nor does it control any longer. It says, "For in that he died, he died unto sin once; but in that he lives, he lives unto God." And look at what it says here. It says, "Likewise, reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed to what? To sin." Notice it says, "Likewise." So. So it is basically telling you, just the same way it, it is about Christ, he is telling you, you need to consider the same thing for yourself. Wow. See, you need to consider the same thing for yourself, that you are dead to sin, but alive unto God. 
Then it says here, since you're dead to sin, this is the whole aspect, okay? This is what it's, it's talking about. Let not sin, see, S-I-N, not sins, S-I-N-S, -S, but sin. What does he mean? In other words, what he's saying is, don't let the sin nature reign in your mortal body. In other words, uh, since you have been delivered from it, it's not that it has is disappeared because you and I still have to deal with it, right? But its power and its right to govern and control you has been null and void through the person of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so now the Bible tells you, you are the person that are not supposed to allow it to rule and to govern your life. Man, we can spend a weeks on this thing for us to come to an, un, an understanding. You see, uh, you and I are not supposed to let sin. So, so when you talk about any kind of sin, sexual sin, perversion, it doesn't matter. Whatever kind of sin that, that you and I are dealing with, uh, one of the ways that you can work your way out of this stuff, uh, one of the ways that you and I can work our way out of this stuff is is to understand, okay? We, we can work our way out of this is for you and I to first understand that you're, you and I are delivered from from this nature of sin or this this sin nature. We don't have to obey it. We don't have to do what it tells us to do. When temptation comes, we don't have to yield to temptation. You see, now I want you to pay close attention to this. That God says, let not sin. Now, before he never told you that. You can search all through the Bible. Jesus never told you that, and he never told you this because there was no way for you not to let it because you were governed and controlled by your sin nature. You were not born again. Who is this Bible written to? It is written to folks who are what? Born again. So before, you did not have the ability not to let sin reign over you because you were Satan's children. John 8, 44 says, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own accord, for he is a liar and the father. You see, so Satan has kids. The scripture tells us in 1 John 5 that the whole world lies in what? In a wickedness, is under his spell, is under his, his governorship or his his control. So those who are not born again, they are his children. You see? So so when the Bible tells you here, let not, that's on you. You see? That, that, that is on you. That's something that you and I can allow or we don't have to allow. Uh, uh, let, me, let me show you why, why is that. Look, see. let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye yourselves... Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of what? Of righteousness. How could God tell us this now? Because you're born again. See? Because you're born again. Since you and I are born again, you don't have to yield to sin. Why? Because the Spirit of God is in you, you have been uh, crucified with Christ. You no longer live, but Christ lives now on the inside of you. Look at, uh, hold your place right there, and look at uh, Galatians 2. Go to Galatians 2 and verse 20. So now you have a choice. So, so even the things that are in your life, friend, uh, and that have taken such control of your life, uh, if you if you live out and walk out this truth, and instead of you trying to do it all by yourself, you 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 depend on the strength and power of the Holy Spirit. You can beat it. Okay, uh, look at Gal Galatians two and verse twenty says, "I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by what." 
by the faith of the Son of Man, God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So you see, when you come to Romans chapter 6, you, be, you should understand that you are not the same person. That you, you, you should understand that you have been born again, that you are a new species, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Okay, that when Christ died, you died. When he was buried, you were buried. And when you, when he was raised to life again, when you were born again, you have been given a, 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 a total, totally new life. You have. It's on the inside. Your, your spirit has been reborn, right? When we say God comes inside of you, where does he come? Where does he reside? You say in me, in you where? Where does he reside in you? That's right. He resides in your spirit. That's where God resides. He resides within your spirit because you are a spirit being. Okay? And what he does now, as he works with you and I and mold us into the image of his son, then he's able to work with you and to manifest this person through you, but he doesn't make it. You have to yield to him. Okay? Y'all following me? You follow me. God bless you, man. You follow me? This, this is what the Holy Spirit does. So we're sons. We're sons. We're sons of the living God. You see? And we're sons in our spirit. And the Holy Spirit on the inside of us begins to work that thing as we, as we yield to him. The Holy Spirit begins to work this and, 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 and begins to work his nature, his character, his life through our personalities or our person. The Holy Spirit begins to live this life through us as we yield to him. Okay? Okay, I don't think I understood the explanation of my question. Or maybe I did phrase the question. Here it is again, differently. I see creation as both people and environment. And I understand how people will be liberated. But what in nature will be liberated that makes it relevant to chapter 8? N nature will be liberated from sin. Okay? And I, I look at this, this two different ways. Uh, uh, you and I can help, and, and the church can help uh, quite a bit in nature today. As we manifest who we are and we begin to live and walk out God's plan and purposes for our lives. Then, then we can bring about tremendous changes and help in life in general. Nature is ultimately released from this bondage, of course, when Christ comes back and releases it from the thing that it been made subject to, which is sin. This is when ultimately nature and all of us are completely released. You and I are released from certain things that hampers us when we, when we either put off this natural tabernacle or this tent or this physical body and we die and go to be with the Lord. Then we're, we're, we are released from, from, from this this environment, if I can use that this phrase of sin. You see, you, we are totally released. But, but, but if we walk with God, if we function with God here on the earth now, the, the way God wants us to, there's a degree of, of, of release and experience that you and I can experience right now on the earth. Are you following me? And so this, this, is, this is how I'm putting this forward so I hope I hope you 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 get that part okay uh, isn't it isn't the Bible written to everyone not just to the reborn those who are not reborn must have a way to learn the route to achieve such status no the Bible is not written to every believer 
The Bible is written to, I'm sorry, not to everyone. It's written to believers, those who are born again, because it only makes sense and can only be applied to folks who are born again. The people who are not born again don't live this, and they can't live this. The Bible said they are in darkness, okay? They are in darkness. They are not able to live the word of God. They're not able to walk the word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in them. Christ doesn't dwell in them. They are not born again, so they are not able to live this. This is the only reason why God could say, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He doesn't say that to the world. Why? Because they're still in sin. They're still in bondage. They're still under the control of Satan. Are you following me? He can't say that to them. He can say that to you and I who have been what? Who have been liberated from it. When were we liberated? We were liberated at the cross. Even if you don't experience it, it doesn't mean that it's not true. It is true because this is what Jesus did for you and me. Now it's up to you and I to learn the scriptures. And that's why we're talking about being led of the spirit. Because we need to understand these things. And we need to understand where, uh, where, where, where is the place that God, the Holy Spirit, lives. Uh, how is it that He leads you and I? So nature is used synonymous with the flesh or the natural, not environmental, as in trees and earth. I think I think nature covers all of that. I don't think it just covers one thing. I think it covers all of that. Uh, when you're talking about the environment, well, we know that the environment will ultimately be what? It will ultimately be released when you are, when Christ comes back uh, 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 on the earth. The environment will ultimately be released. But can the environment uh, can the environment gain any benefit? from the sons of God being manifested now on the earth? Are there any benefits to the environment, to, to people in general, when God's people begin to manifest who they are and what they are on the earth? Are there any benefits? Are there any benefits? Will there, will there be any benefits? There will be benefits for people. I'm pretty sure there'll be benefits for everything if, 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 we, if we come into the place where we begin to walk in our sonship, in who we are and what we are. There'll be benefit. You see? There'll be benefit. There'll be things that we will be able to do and will do that will be beneficial. But like I said before, ultimately the earth will be fully released when you and I are... are uh, when Christ, I should say, returns and changes the earth and lifts the curse from the world. All right? Uh, uh, somebody else said, yes, but how would they learn? Well, you have to be born again first. Let me show you. In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, remember John chapter 3, Nicodemus, a ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus. And he said, uh, and he said, Rabbi, I know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you do except God be with him. What did Jesus say to him? Jesus said, Nicodemus, except a man be what? Born again. He cannot, he cannot what? He cannot see. Well, Jesus is not just talking about physical sight, right? The implication here, he cannot understand the things of the kingdom. He, he just cannot. He's not born again. He cannot understand the things of the kingdom. And then Nicodemus shows you exactly what Jesus meant. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? You see, you see how crazy that sounds? How, how are you as an old man going to go back into your mother's womb? That's, that's totally crazy, right? Jesus said unto him, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. He said, That which is born, that which is flesh is flesh, and that which is spirit is what? Is spirit. So Jesus is not talking about 
a, a natural thing. He's talking about a spiritual thing. And so when he tells Nicodemus here, except a man be born again, you cannot understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, what does it say? It tells you the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Chapter 2, and it says, verse 14, he says, for the, but the natural man receive not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. You see, these things are foolishness to people who are outside of the covenant of God. Neither can they know them because they are, they are spiritually discerned, they are spiritually learned and or recognized or understood. All right? We use books to teach non-readers. Aren't we supposed to use the Bible the same way? Of course. But the Bible is for those who are born again. So so uh, let me put it this way. Uh, what, do you, what is the first thing you're to do with a non-believer? If the person is a non-believer, the first thing the non-believer has to do is what? It's to be born again. So you preach the gospel so that the unbeliever could what? Could accept the gospel and could accept Christ and be born again. When they are born again, then they are supposed to be what? Discipled, right? And discipled mean what? They are supposed to be taught the things of God so that they what? So that they can grow and mature and, and come into the inheritance of sonship. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense to you. That is the same thing that God is trying to tell you and I here. He's trying to say the same thing to us, right? So, so the non-believer can't understand these things. They're, they're foolishness. He's not alive. They're not alive spiritually. These things are not going to make logical sense. And remember, when you and I are, not, when you and I were, were were sinners or when you and I were not born again we 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 um we channeled everything everything that came to us were we 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 we, we utilize all of this or I should say we interpret all of that through logic and reasoning but the word of god is not it is not through logic and reasoning because faith doesn't make sense at all. The word of God is understood through your spirit. Hence why I'm teaching this way. So that we can we can we can follow along and we can understand. I am a spirit. I have a soul that is made up of my mind, my will, and my intellect my emotions and I live in a body and when my body is dead I am still me I am still alive are you are you are you following me when my physical body dies I I just left the earth it doesn't mean I am no longer anymore in existence all right, and one last point on this. One last point on this uh, is in Luke. Okay, one last point on this is in Luke 16. Uh, just to just to help us to understand this, Luke 16. Is it Luke 16? Let me see here. Ah, uh, let's see here. No, it's not Luke 16. It just kind of fails me right now. But, but you, you know, you'll go back and look at it. But this is what it says. It says, Jesus speaking about the rich man and the, uh, uh, and the beggar. And remember he said, the rich man died. And where did he go? He went into Hades. The, the, the poor man went where? The, the, the poor man went into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man saw the beggar. You remember that? 
So he recognized them. He had all of his mental faculties. Uh, it says that he could feel. You see? He was concerned about his brothers on the earth. This is what Jesus is saying. So when I leave my body, I, 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 am, I am not, I'm dead as far as this world is concerned. I am no longer able to function in this physical world. Because my physical body is dead. But I, who live in the body, I'm still me. I'm alive. And the believer is in heaven. And the non-believer is in Hades or hell. Luke 16 and verse 19. Right? Luke 16 and verse 19. Now, I was right. Luke 16. There was a certain rich man. You can see it here, right? And so, and so when you go back, you understand, you understand, you are a spirit. The Holy Spirit or God lives in your spirit. And, 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 and he works through you, through, through your uh, attitude. He works through, through your person, but he lives in your spirit. So he communicates with you in your spirit. This is where God communicates with the believer. All right, all right. Uh, we got to we got to hurry here. We're going out of time here. Y'all y'all doing good. Y'all got some good stuff coming. I think there are two responses. People who are unbelievers can read the Bible and be convicted to salvation. However, the the literal application of the Bible are for those who are saved. The natural cannot walk in the spirit. Right. I mean, if the if the non-believer reads and gets anything, that's my point. It is to be converted. Period. If the unbeliever gets anything, it's to find God. He has to find God first as Savior. The Bible is written to the believer. It is written to the church. You say, how can you say that? Well... Look at the look at the epistles uh, to to the Philippians church, to the Colossians church, to the Thessalonians church, to Timothy, to Titus, to First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, Galatians, uh, Ephesians. There, there's nowhere in the scriptures where this is written to unbelievers. It is written to believers. If the if the a non-believer gets into the Bible. The Holy Spirit is going to lead them to one thing. Oh my God. Yes, Lord. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you. Uh, look at Acts chapter 8. Let me show you. This, this is where it's, it's right here in the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's, it's right here in the Bible. Look at this. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go towards the south gate into the way that goes down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And he arose and went, and behold, there was an Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for the worship, was returning and sitting in the chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. This is this is a non-believer. He read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, Go near and join yourself to his chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you read? Now watch, watch what he says. How can I except some man should guide me? And, and he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led to the slaughter. That he was led as a sleep to the short slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his share, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. The dude didn't understand what he was reading. So what did Philip do? Verse 34, And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, whom speak? The prophet this of himself or of some other. Then Philip opened his mouth 
and began at the same scripture to preach what? To preach Jesus to him. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain place. And the eunuch said, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all your heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is what? The Son of God. And he commanded the church to stand still. And what happened? He bat Philip baptized him. And then Philip was taken out of the way. Uh, do you see this? This is, this is what... The unbeliever first has to come to. First base. None of this applies to them if they don't come to first base. Once they come to first base and are born again, now this applies to them. You see? So it said, therefore, the guidance that the Bible provides are only for the, belief, the believers. It's only for them. The bread of heaven is only for them. That none of us have a right to this until you come into covenant with God. You have to be in covenant. All right. Does that make sense? <laughs> I hope you got it. It's right there in the Bible. So when we preach the gospel or we're teaching the gospel to the non-believer, the Holy Ghost convicts them of sin. John 16. He convicts them of their sin, that they have not believed on Christ. When they turn their lives over to Christ, now they're in covenant. What happens when they turn over, over their lives over to Christ? Now they become children of God. All right? Okay. Okay, praise God. All right. All right. So so now, so now listen to this now. Listen to this. I'm going to close with this, okay? I'm going to close with this. So now when you get to Romans chapter 7, Paul is continuing in the same thought. And he's going, to, he's going to give us practical application so that we can understand what who we have become. All right? And you find that in the writings of Paul much. Now in Romans chapter 7, stay with, forget the chapter. Stay with the thought. He said, now you know you not, brethren. For I speak to them that know the law, how that the law has dominion over a man as long as he what? As long as he what? He lives. As long as you and I live, the law has dominion over us. And if you just look at it naturally, you have to abide by these laws. Is that right? Now, no, notice how Paul is teaching us. He said, for the woman which has the husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as what? As he's alive. We know this. We don't have to try to, you know, uh, uh, open this up or extrapolate it, uh, 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 fish it out. You know, you, you understand this, right? He said, but if the husband is dead, she is what? Well, you understand that. If the husband died, she's automatically released from what? From her covenant of marriage with her husband. And now she's free to do what? She's free to marry another. So the law now cannot apply to her or the law cannot uh, 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 keep her from marrying somebody else. Why? Because of death, she is legally free from what? From the law that bound her to her husband. Are you following me? So he said, So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called what? An adulterer. You understand that. An adulterer is a, is a person that's not satisfied with what they have, and they go outside of what? Of that covenant while they are married. You, 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 you follow that, right? So he said, but if her husband is dead, she is free from that law. So that she is no what? Adulterer, though she be married to what? To another man. Now, look at verse 4. Wherefore, my brothers, you also, oh man, 
I'm just going to say see law right here. All the stuff that we've been saying in Romans 6. And, and maybe one day we, are, we, we can take this and just go verse by verse. Okay? He said, he said, Wherefore, my brother, you also are become dead to what? To the law. Now, you, you got to understand it. You, you and I have become dead to what? To the law. That you also might be married to another. <laughs> Even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. That's the same thing Romans chapter 6, the latter part of it says. We, 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 when Christ died, we died with him. Okay? And so when we've been raised, you know, we've been raised to what? To newness of life. We have been raised now to walk with God, not based upon what we can do in and of our ourselves, because that's what that's one of the things the law did. Uh, Paul goes on and tells you, he said, "Is the law sin? Of course not. We will not. Uh, we would not have known sin apart from the law." So then, the the conclusion is that the law is just and holy. The problem is that we are the sinners. We are the breakers of the law. And because we broke the law, then the penalty of breaking the law is death. Uh, are you following me? So, 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 when God, let's just use the Ten Commandments. When God gave us His Ten Commandments, there's nothing wrong with those commandments. Those commandments are pure, they're holy, and they're just. There's nothing wrong with them. If, if there's anything wrong anywhere, is that you and I could not keep them. Now, now, why did God give, give them then? He gave it to so that you and I could see that we were sinful and we needed Him. So the Bible says, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh... You see, the problem was you and I. So you and I was trying to fulfill God's law by the strength of our own power. Because remember, we were alienated from God. We were not born again. So we were trying to attempt to fulfill God's law on our own merit. We were trying to satisfy God's demand in our own strength. Uh, am I making sense? So, so I was going to do God's, God's word and I was going to fulfill God's law on the merit of who I am and what, can, what I can do and the strength of my own uh, mind and, and logic and reason. I'm going to do this without God. This is how humans were living. I, I'm going to do this without This is what the law did. And so because we tried to live it this way, we always fell short. So even if you could, could, could keep nine and you missed one, you were guilty of all because the law demanded perfection. So what happened? Come on, talk to me. What happened? We failed. And we failed miserably. Let me give you another thing for you to think about. If for any reason you ever get as a believer to think that you can live right apart from the Holy Spirit, guess what's going to happen? You're going to fail also. Whenever we start living, uh, trying to live this thing out of the strength of our own person, the strength of our own flesh, without depending on the strength of God, that's what happened. We fail. That's the law. That's the law. Right? And so what happened with Jesus? Jesus came and he did what? He fulfilled the laws of God. Right? He fulfilled it to the letter. Jesus never one time sinned. He fulfilled the law, but he did it as our representative. Do you see that? He came as a man on behalf of a man, right? And so he fulfilled God's demands as a man. The last Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. So he had you and I in mind. Then he went to the cross and he paid the ultimate price 
for your sin and mine. And so he died as a sinner. He wasn't a sinner, but he died as one. He was not a sinner. He did not sin, but he died as a sinner in my place. He died for me. <clears throat> he was buried. When God raised him from the dead, God accepted his sacrifice for sin and for all of us as sinners because he bore our, he, he took our place on the cross. So now when we put our trust in him, then what he did for us is, 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 is placed, uh, how, how, how can I say it, Lord? What Jesus did for us it was credited to our account. So when we put our trust in Christ and we accept Christ as our Savior, God credits all of that to our account. And so now when we are born again, it's just like we never sinned. We become God's family. Spiritually speaking, my spirit has been reborn. And the Holy Spirit comes and he lives inside of me. The very nature and character of God, is, it becomes the DNA of my spirit. Substitution, exactly. Accredited. He accredits that to my account. So literally speaking, you and I become saints when we come to Christ. God does not hold any of our sin on our behalf. But watch this, watch this. Watch this. It's not just the sins that God takes care of. He takes care of the sin, the nature. Our sinful nature is taken away. Bible calls it the body of sin, the carnal nature. That is taken the other way. It, its power cannot govern us. It cannot govern us anymore. We are no longer a slave. Slavery makes you. Sonship you obey. Are you following me? And so that's what occurs when Christ comes into our life. So by virtue of death, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and I reckoning ourselves dead, because God accredits that to us, we become righteous in God. Guess what? The law of sin and death no longer applies here. Does, are, are you following me? Hence, look at this. Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Period. That's where it needs to stop. Uh... The American Standard Version omits who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Because that next part of that verse is a qualifying verse. And that, to me, that does not fit here. This is added. Because the Bible said, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ. Not if you walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, which qualifies it. No, 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 no. There is no... There is no condemnation to them who are in Christ. There is conviction to us, but not condemnation. Why? Because we have become sons of God. Are you, are you, are you here listening to me? So God doesn't condemn us. G read Romans 8. Jesus doesn't condemn us. Why? Because he was condemned on our behalf. That's double jeopardy in, in the legal term. You cannot condemn somebody for a certain uh, crime. And then if they, are, uh, if they are released, then you come back and condemn them for the same. You cannot do that. Jesus was condemned on our behalf. Can I read the next verse? It says, for the law of the spirit of life, where? In Christ. Has made us free from what? From the law of sin and death. Now watch how this law governed us. For what the law could not do. In that it was weak through the flesh. The carnal nature. The sinful nature. 
God sending his son in the likeness of sin, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. <clears throat> Watch this. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. This is what's been accredited to us when the sin nature, when we turn our lives over to Christ, the sin nature was ob not obliterated. The sin nature was destroyed. His power, his right to govern us, we were released from it. Now we have become sons of the living God. We have the nature of God. And now God takes us and we have to learn to go from relying on ourselves to relying on God. Are, are, are you following? Are you, are, you, are you understanding? If we're going to be led by the Lord and we're going to be led by the Spirit, we, we have to grow in these things and understand them. Because what the what this flesh does and what Satan does, he uses your old life, your past life, and the carnal nature to tell you what you are not. He uses your emotions. He uses your mind to remind you of the things that you did in the past. He uses all these things where you don't measure up. And even now, when you miss the mark, and you sin. He uses that in order to get you to feel and to believe that God don't want you. God ain't, you're not God's child. You're not this. You're not that. You're not the other because you sin. You have to remember, beloved, that you are God's child. If you sin, 1 John 1 tells us, we have an advocate with the Father. So you go to the Father and he forgives you of your sin. But a real born-again believer doesn't take pleasure in sinning. A, a person that's truly born again does not go around practicing sin. Are you following me? So, so this is what Romans chapter 7, this is one of the things, one of the strength of what is teaching us that happens here. Is that by virtue of death, the death of the Son of God, you and I that accept Christ, the sin nature no longer governs us. Doesn't mean you can't yield to it. It doesn't mean you can't do what it says, Romans chapter 6. That's why the Bible said, now you yield yourselves. You yield yourselves to God. You have to do that. You see, you have a choice now. You can choose who you want to obey. You can choose who you're going to obey. When I was a sinner, I couldn't choose. That's what I was. But when I accepted Christ into my heart, there's a change that occurred. Now I have the choice. And that's why the Bible say yield. You yield yourself to the Holy Spirit. What, meaning what? Meaning instead of going the way your flesh or the carnal nature tells you, you submit yourself to what God says, what his word says. Okay? Okay, now let, let me close here and say this. Uh, here it says, this goes back to what you said Wednesday. We have to learn to discern God's voice from Satan's and our own. Exactly. You have to learn it. This is the place that discipleship takes place, right? So let me say this as we, as we go off the air. Uh, this is questions that came. Galatians 2 and verse 2 say, it says, what did Paul mean when he said, not even Titus, who was with me, being Greek, was compelled to be what? Circumcised. Well, this goes back to what we're talking about now. Circumcision was first mentioned, I think is in Genesis uh, Genesis 15, I think it was. Is that in Genesis 15 or Genesis 17? Uh, it, it was, it was, it was. It was a sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. And that covenant was that Jesus Christ would come and save the world. That, that's what this circumcision meant. And so the Jews circumcised the foreskin of the male as a, as a symbol of a covenant that they had with God. The New Testament says... That is not the natural circumcision that means anything, but is the circumcision of the heart. 
So what Paul was saying to the Galatians, and you have to understand that one of the problems with the Galatians is that there were false teachers. And these teachers were enemies of the gospel. And they taught that the benefits of the gospel could only be, to, could only be appropriated by the means of you and I fulfilling the requirements of Judaism, which means going back to the law. It implied that only through going back to the law, to Judaism, could the Christian, I'm sorry, could, could the, the person enter the Christian fold. They taught that the promises were made to Abraham and the law as, as a divine institution was not a temporary, it wasn't temporary, but it was meant to be eternal and abiding. In other words, it was not abro abro ab 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 abrogated. It was not uh, removed. So, Paul taught something differently. He taught us that circumcision was for a time. The law was for a time until the perfect should come, until Christ should come. And when that came, and you can read that in, in uh, Galatians chapter 3 and chapter 4. You can read all of that. Uh, that when Christ came, that was abrogated. It, it was not supposed to continue. Right? So Paul is making, he's making, is teaching, and he's teaching the church of the Galatians. And so he shows them where, that not Titus was, Titus being a Greek, there was no necessity for him to be circumcised. Not physically. He could be circumcised, but that wouldn't make any difference if he was or not. That does not give him an entrance or a door uh, to be born again. Why is that? Because when Christ came, God established a new covenant. And the new covenant with Christ means that if you believe in who Jesus is, that's what brings you to salvation. Not keeping the law. Why? Because none of the Pope folks that kept the law could be born again without faith in Christ. Are you following me? So that's what he means when he said, being a Greek, he was not compelled to be circumcised. Then you go to Galatians 5 and verse 23, 2 and 3, it says, Indeed I, Paul, say unto you, that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. And so they said, what does that mean? That's exactly what that means. If you are circumcised, that has no bearing, okay? It has no bearing on whether you could be born again if you're circumcised. It doesn't, it doesn't benefit you in that case. There are maybe, uh, uh, they, they, there may be physical and medical benefits in a, a, a person being circumcised. But that circumcision doesn't provide or profits them anything when it comes to being born again and coming into the kingdom of God. Okay? You have to be what? You have to be born again. Born again gives you a circumcision of the heart and not of the flesh. That's, that's what these things mean. All these natural things in the Old Testament, they mean something and there they are spiritual significance to them that applies in the New Testament. Okay, and then the last one was Galatians 5 and verse 6. It said, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Well, there it is. But faith that works through love. Circumcision was a big deal to them. A, a blood oath like the ceremony. It appears to me that Paul is playing it down and saying that it doesn't mean anything. I don't understand. Well, what Paul is saying is that it had its time where uh, 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 the Jews had to do that to show that they were in covenant with God. So that was required under the old covenant. It was required, but remember, in the book of Hebrews, God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, opened up a new covenant. The fact, read it in Galatians 4, the fact that a new covenant came, it made the old covenant obsolete. 
And so when he established the new covenant, the old covenant is obsolete. And so the old covenant does not require you to be circumcised in order to become a Christian. It doesn't, it doesn't require you to submit, in essence, to, the, uh, to, the, to Judaism or the observance of the law to become a Christian. It doesn't require that. Now what it requires is for you to submit your life to Jesus Christ and by virtue of that, and that only is where you become a born again believer. And in that day, this was, was a fight. And they fought them nail and tooth nail. They fought Paul because they would not, uh, they did not want to let go of the law and embrace Christ. Many of them didn't want to do that. But there was a whole bunch of them that did, right? And what, what that did, that opened up the, the gospel to not only to the Gentiles, but even to the Jews. Because the Bible tells you, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so God's intent was never to justify the Jews by keeping the law. His intent was to show the Jews that by keeping the law, they could not and they needed a savior. And so that was supposed to push them to, to recognize when Christ come and to run to Christ because on the merit of what you and I could do, it was a proven fact that on that merit, we could never rise to the occasion to merit God accepting us based upon our performance. That could never happen because we failed every single time. Amen. Wow. We are out of time, folks. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we'll continue on Thursday night. We'll continue on Thursday night. But, but listen, listen. If you're going to follow the Lord, I learned this years ago, but God took me as a babe and began to teach me because I thought God doesn't talk to me. I cannot hear him because I was listening with my ears and not my heart. And when I began to learn these truths, this is what helped me. And it didn't come easy for me. I struggled. But my God, I'm further now than when I first started. And, and, and it, it helped me to understand how is it that God speaks to me. Uh, you may say, brother, why is it so important? Let me tell you this. Your destiny and my destiny, the road to your destiny, the road that leads to your destiny, and the road to lead that leads to my destiny are two separate roads. God's intent for me and God's intent for you are two different things. I cannot tell you how to fulfill your destiny, every nook and cranny, how to get there. I cannot do that. I can teach you how to hear God. And God will be the one that will take you down the road through the twists and the turns to get you to the end of what you're supposed to do. When I joined the military, I joined it to, 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 to stay there for 20, 30 years. I had nothing else in mind until I got saved. And when I got saved, God got inside of me and began to turn my life upside down. And, and, and the, the thoughts that my wife and I had, the objectives that we had, God changed all of that. And my life has been going through twists and turns. But I will tell you this, at every twist and turn, the Holy Spirit has directed me. And we have done the very best to follow Him. We haven't been perfect, but we have done our best to follow Him. Why? Because God had a certain purpose and plan for Arlene and I and where we are to end up. He has a certain purpose and plan for you. And listen to me. 
you won't get there without your GPS. You won't get there without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can direct you how, how to fulfill what he has designed for you. And in order for you and I to do that, then we're going to have to hear him. We're going to have to listen to him. We're going to have to obey him and follow him. And when we do that, regardless to the twists and the turns, regardless to the smoke screens in your life, regardless to the dark times and the trying times and the difficult times, when you do that, the Holy Spirit will get you to your destination. Because on the road to these twists and turns, he has to perfect you. He has to bring you to maturity. He has to develop you. He has to work out in those attitudes and those things in our lives that are not conducive. See, he has to work all these things out. And he knows how to do it. He knows who you are and how to do it. So don't give up on yourself. God's got you. He knows how to handle you. Your attitude, your issues, your problems, your ups and your downs, they don't scare God. He knows how to deal with you. And he knows how to bring you where you need to be. And if you listen to him, if you learn to listen to him and to follow him, then the God Almighty will fulfill the purpose and the design that he had in mind when he saw you before the world were ever created. And he determined the way that he will live in you and the way that he will live through you. God determined that before time ever was, my friend. This is what I'm talking about. This is the life that the Spirit of God brings to you. That's that will have its challenges. But my friend, it's a life that you and I, that we can be satisfied with. Only the Holy Spirit can do this. And I hope, as you give me the opportunity and the time, I hope to show you just how this can happen. Remember, study Romans 6, 7, and 8. Because we're going to come back and deal with it. Bring your questions again. We'll deal with it some more. Okay, and we'll get to this point, how to follow the Spirit. And I'll show you, as we lay the groundwork and the foundation here, I'll show you how you can do this. Amen. I love you so much. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for my audience tonight, today. Thank you for those who listen to, to, to this word. I, I know that you have spoken to them, and you do speak to them. While I'm speaking, you are speaking, and they have felt you in their heart. They have felt different things quick and light. The light bulb came on in their minds. Lord, you caused them to see you. You gave them understanding. You gave them insight. Even beyond what I'm talking about, Lord. You know exactly where they are and what they needed to hear. And Father, I thank you for it. In the name of Jesus. Would you, would you strengthen my brother? Would you encourage my sister today? In the midst of all the chaos, all the confusion, all the things that's happening in our world, don't let them lose sight of who you are, Jesus. Don't let them lose sight that what they hear and what they see that doesn't, that's not in line with the scriptures uh, doesn't look like you. It ain't you. It doesn't matter who says it is. Lord, help them to understand this. Help them to see this. Help them to recognize this, that you don't change. Your word doesn't change in Jesus' name. And so, Father, I thank you that you are raising up a people and you will raise up a people in the day that we're living in, Lord. A people out of a people that will heed the voice of God, that will submit to God, that will make the kingdom their agenda and not their, not their own agenda, the agenda. Father, in Jesus' name, men and women that are selfless, that are crucified with Christ. Men and women who have given up their lives to Christ. And so Christ now lives on the inside of them. And they stand to represent Christ and Christ only. I thank you, Lord. I thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now lift them today. Bless them. Heal them. Deliver them. Set them free. Those under the sound of my voice. By the authority of the name of and the blood of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I liberate you from every bondage. 
I liberate you from every habit. I liberate you from sickness and disease and infirmity. I liberate you in Jesus' name from the enemy that have hound you and, and fear that have bound you. Oh God, I liberate you in Jesus' name, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I free you by the power of the living Christ, my friend. If you need Jesus, just say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and filling me with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Friend, if you pray that prayer with me, and you prayed it with all of your heart, my Bible says that you have passed from death unto life. Jesus Christ has come into your heart. You are now a born-again believer. Sit down and write us an email, would you? And tell us, man, I just accepted Christ as my Lord and my Savior. We've got some things that we'd like to share with you. You can write us at Power of the Sea at RodolfoPeterkin.org or you can write us at POTS, that's P-O-T-S, POTS at RodolfoPeterkin.org, all right? Rodolfo, R-O-D-O-L-F-O, P-E-T-E-R-K-I-N.org, amen? We'll receive your email, and we will respond to that email. If you got any questions, any comments, if you got a prayer request, my friend, sit down and write us. We want to pray with you and stand with you in faith for your deliverance, amen? Well, until we uh, meet you again on Thursday night, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, the power of the seed is not in its size, is in its contents. God bless you. I love you. Go in peace and be blessed. Bye-bye.